Hello, everybody. How's it going today? Gold Plasma 231 here. Back in day to talk about Hell's Paradise G Goku Raku, episode number seven. This episode is titled Flowers and Offerings, which whenever I look at this episode, I don't really see a whole lot of things having to do with flowers or offerings. I mean, flowers are a big part of this series, even up to this point. So, and we get a bit more information on that. So it makes sense why we have this flowers in the name. But offerings, I'm not really too sure I get that part of it, right? But this is a very dense episode of Hell's Paradise Shigoku Raku, as I'm going to call it, because a lot of things happen in this episode, we get a lot of information, and all this information builds up to the one core mystery that we've been searching for the entire time this series has been going on, all previous six episodes, right? But that isn't really the most interesting thing about this episode to me. The most interesting thing has to be the way this episode was animated by MAPPA Studios, of course, people who animated it. And that is... Mo and that is mostly because of the chapters that were that were um, not animated. Um, now I guess animated the chapters that were animated in this episode, right? So of course, last episode it was nearly a perfect adaptation, going from episode from like chapters. What was it? It was like thirteen to about sixteen and a half, right? And this episode goes finishes up the last part of chapter 16 in our initial part of the episode before the opening, right? And then it anima animates chapter 17 and 18 fully complete perfectly. And then it animates the first few pages of chapter 19, and that is all during the time from the opening to the break in the episode. And then after the break in the episode, we all, just, all of a sudden skip the chapter to the very tail end of chapter 21. And then we animate that perfectly until the end of chapter 28, or not 28, um, 22, right? It's not, we only even finished chapter 22. But this episode is just animated in such a weird way. It's a weird way to do this adaptation. I understand why they did it. Because next episode, we are going to be getting a lot of information on Tinza and, ooh, what was, what's the girl's name? Nurgai, right? We're going to be getting a lot of stuff dealing with them, and they wanted to put all of that in one big episode. So, they sort of split this off to not have that sort of, end on a weird cliffhanger. It won't be a weird cliffhanger, but I understand why they did it like this. But to sort of explain more of that, I guess we just need to go and hop into the episode itself. So, that's what we're going to do, right? So we start off this episode with, of course, Aza and Toma stumbling across these two women who were making out on top of the big thing. I mean, the rubble sort of looking structure, right? And the two of them looked at them and they went, looked over and just gave Aza and Toma this like look of disgust, right? And we start off exactly where that ended as one of the people hops down and says, why humans? Um, why are you guys here? Like, what were the Soshin doing? Um, Soshin, as we're going to learn later in this episode, is the term for all of the big, weird monk, animal, creature. All of the weird animal creatures on this island. All of those are called Soshin, right? And they pretty much was like, hey, what are these two Soshin doing? Or what are these Soshin doing? Why are two humans here and everything? And they're like, well, they never make it this far. And one of the other people was just like, oh, maybe they just wanted to come and fool around with us. But the other one of these people, there's one with yellow hair and one with pink hair. The one with yellow hair is getting very aggressive. And is just like, no, don't even try to make those jokes, younger sister, or something along those lines. And then starts to tense up as we see like all the veins bulging out of them. As all of a sudden their body transforms and from one of a woman to one of a man. And all of a sudden just hops down to sort of face off against both Azachobe and Toma. At this point, we do a, um, a screen cut, pretty much, as we cut over to Gaimaru's group, right? Of course, this is Gaimaru, Sagiri, Azuriha, and Sinta, who are all looking down at this sort of ruined village. And Gaimaru um, is responding to what Sinta said last time, because Sinta was talking about how the island of Shinsenkyo um, has legends of hermits living on it, right? And Gaimaru s says something along the lines of, hey, 
if there's hermits on this item, it doesn't matter. What matters is if whatever we find are friend or foe. And at this point, as he says this, we see a cloaked figure, um, a very short one, for instance, pop up behind a tree. And as they sort of look off, we see it's the face of a young girl. And all of a sudden, we cut to the opening, which is, of course, work by Reno Shin Sheena and Millennium Parade. Of course, in my opinion, this is an amazing opening. But at this point, seven episodes in, there's not nothing else I can really say about it, right? It, it's just a great opening. So after the opening, we cut over to Gabimaru suddenly turning around, and like I guess his presence sensing of being a ninja of the Agakaware village sort of works, and he looks around and realizes there's a child there, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna run after that. And that's what he does, sort of leaving the rest of the group behind, and as he's running by, there's like a tree creature that suddenly appears, and goes and swats Gabimaru sort of across the face, and slings him back a little, right? And this is a pretty much humanoid tree who's starting to attack the whole team, right? But Gabi Mars is like, all right, I'm going to run after Child. If there is another person on this island who would know something, it is probably them. So I need to run after them and try to chase them, right? And at this point, Sagiri is like, all right, I need to stick with Gabi Mars. So she decides to chase him as he's chasing this child. And Yuzuriha and Sinta are then left to deal with these big tree creature, right? And what Yuzuriha does is, is they're starting to attack. Yuzuriha sort of takes off Sinta's glasses and throws them out, sort of saying to, hey, if I'm going to fight, I'm going to use my ninjutsu, and I'm not going to give you an edge up on what that is. As we see that she takes off, like, because this entire time on her side, she's had, like, a few clay pouches and everything, and she takes one of these, uncorks the top of it, and drinks whatever mixture of liquid is in this thing, right? And as she drinks it, she seems to start secreting some fluid out of all over her skin, right? I can't really tell if it's meant to be sweat globbing up or something like that. I mean, I have read the entirety of Hell's Paradise, but to be honest, I never really cared to remember what Yuzuri Ha's power actually was. So she just got this weird thing where she seems to secrete a lot of liquid. At this point, we cut back over to Gabi Mario, who is um, chasing this young child, and he catches her, and he's just like, okay, I can do this, right? I've got this child. But as he got her, the child sort of reaches out and grabs Gabi Mario's arm and swings him around and sort of just throws him from behind onto the ground, sort of very much overpowering Gabi Mario. Sigiri then comes up, and she sort of tries to reason with this child a little bit, just saying like, hey, hey, it, it's okay, or like, Gabimaru is not trying to hurt you or anything, we just want answers for what's going on here. And the girl who was previously running away sort of slows down and turns around, and Gabimaru is like, right, this is my chance, as he runs over to try to apprehend her. But all of a sudden, she turns around with this glowing fist, right? I mean, it is just a fist that is glowing yellow, and goes and just punches Gabimaru, or Sagiri walks up and tries to punch Sagiri, and Gabimaru hops in a way to sort of block it off, and he's just like, oh my gosh, this is like super strength, like I don't know if Sagiri would have survived this if, if this would have hit her. As he sort of does this, he sort of thinks back to his motivation of like, all right, this girl may know something about where the elixir of life is, and if that, I can get back to my wife, and I can get back home. So he's eventually like, all right, I'm gonna, I need to apprehend this girl no matter what happens. As he sort of jumps out of the way and jumps behind a tree. And running up this tree are a bunch of vines, and in the typical shonen anime trope, he pulls the vines off, and somehow they tie up the child up in top of a tree, right? And all of a sudden, Sigiri's just like, jeez, Gabimaru, like, that's way too over the top. And then this girl starts crying a little bit, and Sigiri's like, all right, Gabimaru, get her out of the tree right now, or else you're not going to like what's going to happen to you. So Gabimaru relents, lets the child down, and Sigiri comes over, and she starts to confront the child and sort of just pick her up in her arms. And at this point, we just all of a sudden cut back to the entire group being back together, right? We see that Yuzuriha, or, and Sinto, who Sinto now has his glasses back on, we see him actively putting his glasses back on his, we see that Gabimaru and Sigiri walk back up to them, so they bested the tree creature, and of course, Gabimaru and Sigiri do have this young child. So at this point, the tree sort of gets up, and he's just like, all right, hey, 
give me back that girl and if you do i'll take you to the village and give you all the answers that you seek right and the whole team or especially gaimar and sagiri are just like okay this could just be a trick and you're just trying to lead us back to the village you're just going to kill us and everything and all of that but the two of them are just like yeah, I mean, it's probably the right idea, and Zagiri and Sinter are saying the same thing. So eventually they just talk, and the creature's like, alright, I have food. And they're like, okay, and they're like, I have a place to rest. And they're just like, okay, that's not big of a deal, we can find all that stuff on our own. But all of a sudden he says, I also have a bath. And at this point, Yuzuri Ha just says, you know what, we're going to do that. And we cut to just the whole team just walking with this tree creature, the young girl, and the rest of the team just all following him. Right? And at this point, we suddenly cut again to the entire team in this ruined village. I think Gaimaru calls it a ghost town. And this creature, the tree creature, says that, hey, this wasn't like this until about a thousand years ago. Sort of saying that, yes, there's something up here for this guy if we couldn't tell already. But as they get in, um, we sort of just see they all sit down and the guy's like, right, this is my house, this is what's going on here. And Guy Mars was like, alright, hey, you said you were going to give us the answers, we gave you the girl back, let's give us, like, give us the answers, please. But for a few Zuri Haas, was like, hey, I need to take a bath, and th that's where we cut to, Sig or it is not Sigiri, um, but Zuri Haas just taking a bath. Um, we see on the outside there is Sinta and Gabi Maru, and on the inside is Sigiri, who is now hopping in the bath along with Zuri Ha, pretty much saying, alright, the only reason, um, Yuzuri Ha is inside the bath and Sinta isn't, is that Sinta probably wouldn't want to be inside there, so Sigiri and Gaimaru switched off partners and everything for a time being, yada, 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 right? So keeping one extra, or one Yamada Simon with one criminal. Makes enough sense, right? But as all of that happens in, the young girl finally walks in, and they just sit down with some washcloths for both Sigiri and Yuzuri Ha to wash with, Right? obviously sort of giving the note of oh hey it looks like the child is really warming up to sigiri so that is very nice to see at this point we cut op over inside the house of the cre tree creature where gabimaru and sinta are sitting there the creatures offering them food and water but the two of them are just like i don't know if we're going to eat this or sinta's drooling for it and gabimaru's like hey i i don't care about this all i want is answers and as they're eating all of this, and Sinta's like, man, I really want to eat this fruit, the tree creature just says a note of like, hey, um, the little girl eats that, so you were a good to eat it too. And to this, Gaimara asks a question like, hey, what's your relationship with that girl? But the tree creature does not um, give an answer for this question. He purposely says like, I'm not answering that. I'll answer anything else but that. So... As all of the rest of the team come in, there is a big note where all of them are eating up some food, but Gabimaru strictly doesn't eat, right? And everybody's asking him why, but Gabimaru pretty much just says that, hey, I want answers, and that answers is what I'm going to get. Like, I can eat food later. As all of a sudden, the tree creature just starts to give up and say, and we get a big exposition dump here. So we get a whole lot of information about the island, the elixir, and really all of the questions that we want to know the answers to, right? Pretty much the creature says that this is an island that they call Kotaku, or everybody on the island calls it, but it's also the island of Shinsenkyo, where all of the gods live. He specifically says that. Um, Garmar eventually asks, like, hey, is the elixir actually real? And the creature says, yes, of course the elixir is real, right? And he says that the people of the island call the elixir Tan, right? And to that, Garmar says, well, where is this elixir? And the creature's response, it is in the Horai. It is at this point that we learn the entire island is made up of three parts. So just imagine like a circle, right? And equidistant in, you've got three parts to this circle. You've got it circled in the middle, a circle outside of that, and then the outside line, right? There's three different parts of the island. The shore and the woods of the island, so pretty much the outskirts of the island, are called the Ishu. And further in from that, there is the Hojo, which is the ruined village area. And in the very middle of the island is the Horai, where the center mists swirl and where all of the gods live. So that is sort of the big deal, is that it's in the Horai, in this middle part where all of the gods live, in the very center of the island. 
To this guy, Mara says, hey, do we have any proof that this elixir of life actually exists? And to this, the tree creature says that, yes, there is proof. And eventually you'll see that proof firsthand. I'm surprised you haven't seen him already. But once you meet them, you can't deny the fact that the elixir exists. He says, once you meet the Tinsen. As at this point, as he says the Tinsen, we cut over to the fight between Azachobe, Toma, and this weird yellow-haired guy who just transformed into the body of a man. And we see this guy is standing here, right? Except half of his body is entirely chopped off. I mean, pretty much from his neck to his waist, there's a diagonal cut going through him, and half of it is just a bloodied mess on the ground, and the other half is still standing. And as we see this chopped body, we all we, we see it start to have vines shoot out of it and regrow the flesh and the body around it. As we see both Azachobe and Toma just freaking out like, what the world's going on here? But as we see this, we continue to get narration from the tree creature as we just see this other visual. So it's that whole thing of like, all right, we're getting explained it here, but we're also seeing it through a different means. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this was in World Trigger, uh, where in the very beginning of the story, we get the explanation of the actual triggers and how these triggers work as we see all of the people, all of the A-rank agents fighting with Jin to show it, right? That's just one a short example of it. But as we see this, we see the creature, um, the true creature, just start to explain, like, they are eternal. And he's like, all the Soshin and the other creatures that you guys have probably fought sort of saying, like, yeah, all of the other creatures on the island, the Soshin are on another level. As we see in this image, we see that Aza is running up to the creature with his big axe, and he's going to swing it at the creature, or at the yellow-haired guy. And the yellow-haired guy just holds out a finger, and in that typical fashion is Aza swings down his axe, it gets caught on that finger, and the entire axe just shatters to pieces. Right, and at this point, the tree creature, we cut back over to see Godmar and all of the team. The tree creature says, you may be wondering why is the reason I gave you all of these answers and welcomed you in here so nicely. And he says, because I may as well grant the last wish of many people. Because you guys are not going to make it off of this island alive. Even if you go to try to find the elixir of life, the Soshin will kill you and that will be that and you'll be done. Right? Dead men tell no tales, so there's no harm in me telling you any of this pretty much, right? And he pretty much says that you guys are not leaving and he says, but I'm telling no lie in any of this. And he's like, no one leaves. He says, if you try to leave, the Tensin will kill you. And he says they are the most important beings on this island. They command all the Soshin and punish all the guilty, and guilty in this case being anybody who treads upon this land. So pretty much building up the Tencent is like, yeah, these guys are ones not to be trifled with. As all of a sudden we, in this imagery we're seeing, we see that yes, Aza and Toma just get bested by the um, yellow-haired creature, or the yellow-haired Tinsen, as we now know, and this Tinsen sort of picks up both of the bodies and throws them into this pit down below, and we don't exactly see what's in this pit for a few second, seconds, and all of a sudden, um, they just continue, or the creature just, the tree creature overwork I Martin or by, he just continues pretty much saying that, hey, there is no death for anybody on this island, though, so even when they do kill you, you will not die. You will be reborn as flowers. As he says, these flowers are the same source of tan that he's pretty much talking about for, saying that these flowers are the source of the elixir of life. And now we cut back over to Aza and Chobe, or not, uh, yeah, Aza, Chobe, and Toma in the pit. As we see that in this pit down here, um, Aza is laying on the ground, and there are a bunch of vines starting to climb over his dead body as he just gets trapped in these vines, and Toma goes over, and he just starts ripping them up. And at this point is when the tree creature finally says, like, hey, flowers are a source of tan. And we hear one of these flowers puncture Aza Chobe, and at that point we sort of leave that scene as this puncture sound is also being referenced in the scene with Gabi Mar and everybody else as the tree creature taking his hand and snapping it off. And as he snaps it off, he it starts to regrow back as he says, Yes, 
I know the elixir of life exists because I once partook or or partaked or partaked. There's a word in there somewhere. And he says, I once took the elixir of life myself. So I once received its blessing, as he calls it. And at this point where we get the break in the episode. So everything in this chapter, which I just went through from the opening to the break here, that was everything in chapter 17, chapter 18, and the first pages of chapter 19, right? After this, we cut over to another scene. Like I said, it has to do with Tinza and Nuragai. But from here after the break, we go from everything. We take about the chapter that is animated with or adapted or whatever you want to call it from the very end of chapter 21 to the very end of chapter um, 22. So we sort of see this sort of thing happened as we totally cut away from that entire situation itself as we see that Gubby Maru is finally going to take a bath himself, right? As he calls it, wash all of the filth and disgust that got on him throughout the day. And of course, Sagiri is following him, right? Because of course, Executioner needs to be with their criminal at all time, or at least that's what Sagiri calls it. So as they're just walking away, pretty much Gabimaru and Sagiri sort of get a recap of everything that we just heard. Of course, this makes a little sense because this was a few chapters after in the canon of the manga, but in the anime here, it's a bit differently paced. But they pretty much give this recap of, hey, everything that he told us, the elixirs into Horai and everything, it, it seems like he's telling us the truth, but something just seems off about it. And Gabi Maru just comes up like, hey, is we think he's actually lying about all of this? As we cut to a little montage of, not really a montage, but just an image of the two of them sort of saying, or the cr tree creature pretty much saying like, all right, hey, my name is Hoko and this little girl's name is May. We know names. That's nice. I don't have to call him the tree creature anymore. His name is Hoko, which I don't think in Japanese means like tree creature or anything, but... I know tree is key, so, but yeah, I, I don't really know that Japanese good enough yet. But he pretty much says that, hey, we just want to continue to live quietly on this island, not pissing off the Tencent or anything, but just living on our own, right? So, Gabimaru just thinks, like, I, it doesn't seem like you're lying at that sort of end of it, right? They seem pure and honest in that sort of ideal. And at this top point, we cut over to Sinta, who is explaining some more things to the entire group, saying that, hey... All of these terms, such as like Tinsin and Soshin and Horai, they all seem to be high Taoist terms, specifically with Tinsin being the hermits that are um, talked about, right? Of course, Taoist and um, the power being Tan. Um, we'll get more into that later in the series, but yeah, Taoist, as we'll see, is very important coming up here very soon. At this point, we cut over to where Gubby Maru and Sagiri have finally gotten to the bath area, and as Gubby Maru goes in, he lifts up the curtain, and inside is Mei, who is the girl, um, little girl inside, and Gubby Maru sort of just looks in, and she's just sort of staying there, obviously, just getting out of the bath, and he just walks in, so it's like, okay, Gubby Maru, I mean, what do you think you're doing here? Like, that's a little messed up. But Sagiri's just like, hey, 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 what are you doing here, right? And Gabimaru just starts to, like, take off his overcoat and everything to go and start getting in the bath. And he's just like, hey, in Yukakawari Village, everybody bathed together. Like, there was no problem. And he sort of makes a little note of, like, hey, um, do we really need to focus on bathing etiquette when there's such a big, pretty much, thing at stake around here? And as this going on, we sort of look at all of the scars around Gabimaru as he sort of starts to undress and everything to get ready. And at this point, we look over at the girl who sort of um, has a towel covering her front, but on her back, Sagiri looks over and sees that there is a really bad scar running down the entire part of her back. And Sagiri looks around and, he j and she's just like, man, this girl is in very too good of a shape. So he's like, you know what? I'll be your teacher. And what she means by this is she's pretty much going to te teach her how to take more care of herself with all of the um, ointments and stuff inside of the shower area, right? So we sort of see that, like, Gabimaru is just in this sort of tub in a corner as Sagiri just sort of takes care of Mei and sort of cleans her hair, right? Because, of course, yeah, her hair is all gross and everything. And she's like, I can't do anything about that scar, but at least your hair being clean will mean something more to you. 
the next part of this is um is all about gabimaru as sagiri comes over and like puts down a tub for gabimaru to submerge in to sort of clean himself and she pretty much says like hey just take a break right now and like later or pretty much says something like hey just let go of everything for now and just get in and just get yourself clean and at this point gabimaru sort of reflects on his life and he thinks back to his wife whenever his wife said a very key thing similar to what sagiri just said of hey let go of all of your worries for now it'll all be fine later and there's a really nice flashback with the two of them sort of talking and we sort of get this metaphor of like gabimaru being a general and his wife being a sort of strategist in a way and sort of the way the two of them are just operating as we see it they have not officially become um living together yet they're almost very close to being so but pretty much the whole point of it is that she is washing gabimaru's back in this flashback and i do like gabimaru because he has a little note of he's just like hey whenever i feel like i whenever i take a bath or get submerged in water i feel all of the tension and all my battle instincts are just being washed away from me so that's a little bit of a fun thing but at this point his wife just sort of comes in and just dumps an entire um tub of water on his head and gabimaru's just like oh come on now like don't do this and she pretty much just says something to the kin of like, hey, let go of all of the strife that you're feeling and get ready for the big battle. And Garmar's like, the big, big battle of what? And she's just like, the battle of life, right? It is going to be the biggest battle you're going to ever have to face. No matter what you sort of do here in the village, whatever ninja task you do, life will always be there whenever you get back and get done with it, right? So as the two of them are sort of going around, um, they just keep on talking and having a really cute moment until eventually she's just like, all right, hey, um, it's time for you to just go get in the bath for sure now. But Goblin Mario is just like, I don't want to do that. And initially I was going to write down like, all right, Goblin Mario is a cat here, but his wife even sort of says that, oh man, Goblin Mario, you're just like a cat. Ha ha ha. Look at that. But a bump and a bump. That's pretty funny, right? Cat Goblin Mario. Ha 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 ha. But at this point, as we sort of get done with this whole scene, Gabi Maru is all dressed and is getting ready to leave. As he looks over to his wife here, and he just says like, Hey, um, if I am the general in this situation, will you get? let me give a sort of um, a tactic or whatever? Or a mission or something along those lines. I forget the exact wording. And she's just like, yeah, sure, what's up? And he says, hey... Um, Whatever you do, don't hide your scar in your hair. Because, of course, of course, she's got a nasty scar all over one side of her face. And he's just like, hey, don't hide your scar from your hair. Be yourself that you are, pretty much. And to this, she's just like, oh, this is just my style. But we see that she's very emotionally touched and is crying a little bit. As God Maru, of course, doesn't get to these. like, oh, is it? My bad. I'm so sorry about all of that. Right? He's like freaking out a little bit. But eventually she's just like, if you say so, you're the general, I will. So another really nice and cool moment here. As we cut out of, out of the Gabimaru flashback, as Gabimaru is now along in the shower still, or in the bathing area with Sagiri and Mei, and as he of course is getting ready to clean and walk out, he looks back over to Mei and he says, hey, girl, don't be ashamed of that scar you have right there. And... So you're just like, well, Gabimaru, hold on. Sometimes women don't have that much of a thing. But Gabimaru says, hey, it doesn't matter. I know a woman who has one of the worst scars I've ever... Or not. He doesn't call it a worst scar. He's like, she's got a really nasty scar, but she's still the most beautiful person I know, right? As he sort of says, like, hey, don't be ashamed of scar. And, like, I know somebody, of course, he's referring to his wife. And he's just like, appearances don't matter. And Sigiri just looks at him. And Gabimaru's like, what, you want to say something? But he's but she is just like you're acting really respectable so that's not too bad so as garmaru starts to walk out we see that may is sort of, sort of very touched by this and runs over and grabs gabimaru's arm as they sort of all walk out together as we see garmaru is walking in the front may's walking behind him and sagiri is following both up sagiri has a little bit of a moment where she's just like who knows maybe gabimaru isn't as bad of a person as we once thought but as we go over and look at Gabimaru, we see that he has a very strained look on his face. Like, this is a look of utter, like, oh boy, right? As he eventually thinks, like, all right, that bath was an amazing reminder of how much I need to get this elixir and get back to my home and fulfill my goal. 
as we see an image of his wife, of course, who is the chief of Agakawari's daughter, standing next to the chief as the chief is looking very sinister, as we can tell. The Gadmar's goal pretty much has to do with taking out the chief so him and his wife can live in peace. And that is where we end the episode, along with the ending of Kamihate by Uru. Ending song, it's fine. I don't have a problem with it. But yeah, that is the episode. I have to say, I do really like all the changes they made in this. Of course, we're going to have a very high octane and high fight episode next time. Of course, with the whole Tenzin thing I've been talking about. And the way they sort of did this, all focusing on the village and May and everything, that is a very nice way to see. And sort of finally knowing these two's names, I mean, that sort of really helps out. Um, yeah, this is a great chapter. I especially like the final part where Gabi Mara sort of shows more of his nice side compared to his just battle instinct so that's really great and awesome um i don't really don't have a whole lot to say on this episode it's really just a lot of lore building all right okay here's all the parts of the island the Ishu, to hojo and to horai to horai is where elixir of life is but on this island there are beings called tensin and they're big bad and they're the hermits of the island who are going to kill kill you and they've got strange powers and Oh no, it looks like Toma and Azuchobe are dead. Like, what are we going to do now? But this is just a really great chapter, or not chapter, episode. Um, again, titled Flowers and Offerings, which I don't really understand. Um, they got through another four chapters, so that's cool. But I really don't have too much else more to say about it. And with that, it's time for the self-promotion of this whole thing, where I just want to say that, hey, I've got the other few episode reviews of Hell's Paradise, Jugoku Rock on channel. So if you were watching this and haven't seen all of those yet, go check those out. And if you did like this video, I hope you mind, wouldn't mind giving it a subscribe or a like or anything like that. It, all those things really help out the channel. Leave a comment down below on what you thought about this episode, all the exposition and lore dumps and everything. I mean, it generally just helps me out all the way. And yeah, I really don't have too much else to say. Um, also linked in the description is a Twitter and Discord community you can come and join to come talk to everybody about, oh, and main manga, Hell's Paradise Shugo Karaku, all of that sort of deal, and yeah, I don't have too much else to say, this was another great episode of Hell's Paradise Shugo Karaku, of course it was episode 7, to have flowers and offerings, and I'll see you guys next time for Hell's Paradise Shugo Karaku, episode number 8, so yeah, that's it for me, and this will be Gold Plasma 231. Hey, hello, everybody. How's it going today? Go Plasma 231 here. Back in the day, talk about Hell's Paradise Jigoku Rock. Rock. If I could speak. Hey, hello, everybody. How's it going today? Go Plasma 231 here. Back in the day, talk about Hell's Paradise Jigoku Rock.